Tell me if this is you. You make art, or movies, or write or perform, or know someone who does, and you feel a little bit of fear about your or their chances of succeeding. It's not clear how things work, or you've heard the crazy odds, and you know that the history of art is filled with brilliant people who died unrecognized. I think everybody deals with it. But I have something that you should see. I found that the understanding of art that we've held for a very long time as people might actually be wrong. And by viewing it differently, this confusion and the history of these lost artists can all be understood. First, take a look at this picture of a man reading the newspaper. Boring. Nothing happening, right? Now, try this one. You probably felt something. Maybe anger, tension, or disgust. Because, while nothing's happening in either image, our brain connects this one to other things. This concept is the core of what we're going to talk about. You see, traditionally, we've thought of our art as having some undefined quality, which thus dictates its success. And this idea runs into endless contradictions. We see countless artists like Mozart or Van Gogh or Franz Kafka who had amazing merit in their work, who nonetheless died in poverty or even took their own lives. And we've covered all these counterexamples with a single statement, that people just can't appreciate the greatness of these artists. But is it really true? We say that people were too dumb, but art works on the instinct. We'll say they lack taste, but there are other great artists, like Picasso, who became rich and famous. We'll say that the unknown artists were ahead of their time, but in many cases, they felt the same way about their work as the public. And we laughed those things off. But what if we didn't? What if we really tried to answer it? We might say they were depressed, but Leonardo da Vinci didn't care much for the Mona Lisa, and he seemed fine. Perhaps they were too close to their work, Maybe, but reasoning tells us that the more we have to repair an idea, the less likely it is to be true. So maybe, this whole time, there's been a better idea. One which explains all of this simply and clearly. Which is that artists like Van Gogh, who didn't care for their work and the public who didn't either, were not wrong or foolish. And neither are we, the people who love his work now, but instead, they and we are simply looking at the same art and seeing something different. And that's what we saw in the beginning. As we've talked about, we judge art and entertainment by how it makes us feel. And our feelings are in proportion to the number of factors there are to cause them. We get more scared by a bump in the night, for example, than one during the day. Thus, once we recognize that external things are part of what we feel about something, we can see that the deepest feelings we have about a work of art come when both the art itself and the external factors are working. Anything that lacks those external feelings will thus come up short for us. And since our feelings don't talk, we won't even recognize why we don't care, unless or until something fills in that gap. So let's look again at Van Gogh. People didn't care for his work in his time, but as the story goes, at some point after he was gone, people suddenly realized his talent. But with this, we can see that there was no magical realization. Instead, people found out about his life story, the lack of success, his depression, cutting off his ear, and his possible suicide. And then, when they viewed his art, their brains didn't just process his brilliant technique, but also a story, a tragedy, about unappreciated genius, which is very powerful. And that feeling mixed with viewing the art itself and caused people to suddenly feel the power of masterpieces in his work. And this is no rare event. The same thing propelled Kafka's writing and even things like A Confederacy of Dunces. So what this means really is that these people, for all their talent, were fighting hopeless battles. No artist can enchant the public solely with their work. Even Mozart was famous in his life for his exhibition tour as a child prodigy a factor outside his actual work, and thus we can understand why he struggled to interest people once he grew up. Too many notes, that's all. This is absurd. Now, of course, he's known as the greatest composer, like Shakespeare in writing. Again, though, those are outside elements. In fact, this means that no one has ever painted an artistic masterpiece, nor written or directed or composed one, at least as we understand it. 
At best, we've only had half the story. And in fact, sometimes not even that. These external alpha factors, as I like to call them, can often overpower the impact of the work itself. After all, artistic representations often struggle to feel real. While these outside factors are 100% real, and thus always at full strength, they can hamper a brilliant talent who doesn't have them and elevate someone without talent if they unknowingly do. And so, trying to predict and understand the results of art without them has never worked. Maybe like weighing the universe without knowing about dark matter, or doing geometry before we realized that space can be bent. But now, things can start to make sense. We can see today, for example, why so many directors' first works, the ones where they were underdogs taking on the world, are rated higher than their following movies. Despite the later ones having bigger budgets, professional actors, and more experience, we can see why the screenplay for Casablanca could be sent out to readers at movie studios under a different name and make no impact at all. And, most importantly, we can start to study and understand these factors. And thus, finally, get some control over our fate. And we're going to talk more about it here. But for now, the thing to remember is that the magic of art and entertainment is not on any screen or canvas or stage, but in our minds when art and the world come in together. Thanks.